Rajiv Malhotra is a renowned computer scientist who spent the last 50 years in the USA studying artificial intelligence, computer science, geopolitics, as well as ancient Indian scriptures. There's countless podcasts that can be created with this man, but I felt like at this time in human history, we should be talking a lot more about geopolitics. This decade has already begun with an iconic two years that the world is going to remember forever. And this has created kind of a ripple effect all over the world. The international governments are behaving in a particular way. There's turmoil in certain parts of the world. There's so many natural calamities that are happening all over the world. History as we know it is gradually shifting. At this point in time, we need a geopolitics expert to shed light on this subject. That's why Rajiv Malhotra has been brought on on TRS. Remember to follow TRS on Spotify. We're a Spotify exclusive now, which means that every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. With that, get ready for one of the deepest, most intense conversations that we've had on the show. Rajiv Malhotra, sir, I've been waiting for this podcast. Thank you for being on the Ranveer Show. My honor. I'm delighted to be here. Sir, how's it going? How are you? Chalra, life, is, life goes on. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm recovering from some illness. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to get too personal. But uh, I'm delighted to be here on your show. I've heard so much about you. Uh, appreciated what you do. And so this is a good opportunity for me to also share my life, my ideas. So I think the show had begun with this intention of taking ideas, wisdom out to the world. That's why we had begun this podcast in the first place. Very rarely do I have a guest where I myself am slightly confused about where to begin, you know, because you know so much about so many topics, weird geopolitics, history, AI. Uh, what would you say is your life subject? And I'll ask, I'll tell you why I ask you this, because I strongly believe that while everyone's sort of a polymath nowadays, even the best polymaths have one subject, which is their favorite above the others. So what's it's your very, subject? It's a brilliant question. Very uh, good, good place to start. I'm very happy. So my one quest, since I was a kid, uh, early teens, maybe even earlier, has been a very philosophical discovery of the nature of the self, the nature of the universe, uh, uh, and my place in it, and hence, what should be my life's mission? Uh, what am I supposed to do? I, I was a philosophical, contemplative person as a young child. I read a lot. I read so many philosophies very at a very early age. And you know, this, this quest of uh, uh, discovery uh, led me to philosophy. Then it led me to the physics. I became a physicist for the sole purpose of understanding philosophy, both uh, through a scientific lens, and of course, very deeply uh, interested in reading and understanding the Vedic traditions, the Buddhist tradition, the Jain tradition, uh, and other, and Christianity, Judeo-Christianity, uh, Western philosophy. So my quest for knowledge about the higher levels of existence beyond just mundane, uh, has been the primary uh, purpose of my life, primary objective. I, I achieved a lot in business. I quit all that in order to pursue this. And, and I keep pursuing this. And when I run out of, uh, when I feel that my pursuit is wrong or pursuit is limited or reached a dead end, I, I reset. Uh, many times in my life, I have reset and reinvented myself in order to continue this pursuit. So mm. the pursuit is the same, but how I'm doing it, with whom I'm doing it, how I've defined myself keeps in, uh, changing uh, in order to optimize this particular pursuit. And the pursuit is not just for intellectual and academic interest of knowledge and writing books, but I want to guide my life with it. I want to use this, uh, uh, this knowledge of the ultimate reality to understand geopolitics, to understand the world, to understand India, to understand America. How do they fit into this cosmic game? If there's a mm -hmm. cosmic game, where do we all fit in? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? What are the rules of the game? And mm -hmm. this is very interesting. This is a game where there is no, uh, there is no user manual. Uh, you mm -hmm. can't say, hey, user manual, these are the rules and you, you do this and that. 
uh, every game that uh, humans have invented, we have some kind of a guide and there's some headquarters you can go and challenge. Uh, there is no such thing. Yet we know that we are supposed to do certain things. We're not supposed to do certain things. Uh, but there is no headquarters where you can go and uh, make a petition or have a hearing or uh, 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 hold someone to responsible to explain it to us. Uh, so the uh, interesting thing is we're supposed to figure out the rules. That is part of the game that we're supposed to figure it out. So I find this life and existence to be a fascinating topic. And I've devoted much of my life to its pursuit. So, um, so funny that you talk about the pursuit of life and, you know, the pursuit of purpose, almost. We had someone called Gaur Gauranga Das Prabhuji on the show. Uh, he's a monk from the ISKCON order. And he spoke about how life's purpose in many ways is the moment of death. You know, like how everything leads up to that one moment and then there's a new beginning. So keeping that concept in mind, it's a direct question to you. Uh, again, I'm not, and this is not a direct question to your knowledge. It's a direct question to you, the man. Do you think of your own death ever? Because it's something I've been thinking about a lot after that particular episode. Well, you know, there is something called death meditation. Death meditation is a type of meditation in Buddhism. I have been in it for several big, several big courses. Uh, it's also, it's also in Shaivism. And death meditation is where you achieve such stillness of the body and then stillness of the mind, stillness of the emotions, but you are alert and you're witnessing yourself. And in that state of heightened witness, without involvement, without emotion, without feeling, you suddenly see a, a, a sort of silencing and stopping. You imagine the stopping of the body, uh, the stopping of the mind, the stopping. So each layer of existence, one by one, you kind of do, it's a stimulation of death. And, and uh, you achieve perfect stillness uh, of all, at all levels, but the consciousness is alert, but still. Now, when you practice that, and the Buddhists practice it, so that when they are dying, it's not a very traumatic experience. It is mm. not something you're afraid of because you felt it before already. And it's a very spontaneous transition to another, another state of existence. So I have, I have no fear of death. I mean, I'll be very afraid, uh, very straight with you. I have no fear of death. I don't want pain, bodily pain, but I have no fear of what happens, where I go or all that. I mean, I'm quite relaxed about, uh, about uh, the death uh, uh, challenge, uh, that, uh, the death trauma that everybody faces. And I'm interested having experienced this higher uh, existence, uh, thanks to a guru, that I, the, my guru in the 90s, uh, which is what led me to change my whole life, give up all my businesses and industry and pursue this. Thanks to that experience I was given, uh, now from that experience of uh, existence, I, I want, I'm re-entering the, the world of Vyavarika, a mundane world where there's fighting going on, there's a Kurukshetra, there's good guys and bad guys, and there's all kind of uh, social responsibility, all kind of geopolitics. I look at all of this through a certain lens, and through and that lens you achieve you you uh, you attain when you have actually had this kind of a transformational experience. So that is that is how I am looking at the world. How are you looking at the world? Could you explain it a little deeper, keeping modern day geopolitics in mind? Because we talk a lot about, I mean, at least the youth talks a lot about World War Three, that how it's going to be based on cyber warfare, how it's already begun, how the pandemic is probably a version of World War Three. So, sir, when this whole pandemic broke out, you know, when December 2019 was happening, what was in your head considering the fact that you had already, I'm guessing you had already learned a lot by that point. So maybe you anticipated it. Maybe you know what's coming. What do you think is happening in the world right now, sir? So I think that uh, if you look at the cosmology, uh, the, the, the whole cosmic game, uh, you know, in that Bharat has a very special role. You know, I, I'm looking at uh, from our lens. But Bharat has not honored that role. It is not performing that role. It is not capable of performing that role. It is very highly polluted, corrupted from bottom to top. We can talk about it. I'm very disillusioned with the caliber uh, you know, of, of Indian institutions, Indian, whether it is this government or old government. Uh, generally, generally the, the, what you expect of a tradition, which is the Rashtra that is supposed to lead the world forward, the Vishwa Guru, the world is not being led by uh, Bharat Vishwa Guru at all. 
So that is one thing you have to put aside. You cannot look at the world and say, okay, we are Vishwa Guru. That is how we look at geopolitics. Not the case. It ought to be the case, but what ought to be is not necessarily what is. So if you look at it in a very pragmatic way, India is in trouble. Forget being Vishwa Guru, India is in trouble for its own existence. And, and this is where the, the revolution of artificial intelligence is going to push it forward faster. Uh, the, the, you know, India was sort of hodgepodge. We are doing very well. Then we take a step back. Then we take a step forward. But, you know, what has happened is the best way to understand what is happening with AI is to see what happened with the industrial revolution a couple hundred years ago when Britain started taking factories and electrifying them, uh, which the manual factories were not able to keep up with. And this uh, industrial revolution of Britain made it into a world power, allowed it to uh, colonize uh, advanced, advanced civilizations like India. And then France also became uh, joined the industrial revolution. The two of them were competing. They were at war with each other, but each of them becoming highly industrialized and, and using that to colonize other continents. So entire world history for a couple of hundred years has been was influenced by the, the technological breakthrough called the Industrial Revolution. So what is now happening is another industrial revolution. The AI is the, considered the new industrial revolution. It is going to change the world politics into haves and have nots, just like the previous industrial revolution, Britain and France became the haves, the powerful countries. All others became colonized, became uh, you know uh, have nots, and uh, became ruled. Now I think you will find the same thing. USA and China are equivalent to the Britain and uh, France in the sense that they are the duopoly competing against each other in a cold war. Maybe there'll be a hot war also, just like Britain and France had. But while fighting each other, they're also fighting over who gets what colonies. So uh, U.S. has its sphere of influence. China has its sphere of influence. Not only Pakistan, but pretty much all of Africa and many other places China has captured. So uh, if you, I see the, the geopolitics today as the beginning of a new industrial revolution. Uh, we are in, the, in, this, de in this decade, uh, as much is happening with AI revolution, as happened in 30, 40 years of the industrial revolution when it's because the speed of change is faster. Mm. Um, history repeats itself. So, and in the same way that divide and rule brought us down once, I think we're at the brink of divide and rule bringing us down again. But say if you had to look at it with an optimistic mindset, uh, can we undo this divide and rule mentality somehow? Or is the pandemic undoing it? Is it bringing us all back together? What do you think is happening? Because I still want to look at it with a positive mindset and ask myself that what is the solution to this problem? How do we actually take India at least to that second rung, if not the first rung? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so, you know, the uh, understanding the problem, the whole purpose is then to lead to what to do about it, uh, solutions. So one of the things we have to do is defensive and then offensive, the two, two parts to it. So as far as defensive is concerned, the AI revolution, uh, you know, AI requires two, uh, two ingredients. It requires several ingredients like semiconductors and all that which we are not good at. But two of the ingredients India has a lot, India should control. One is the brain power of the AI programmers, the software people. And India is exporting raw talent rather than using them to build our own intellectual property. Rather than building our own patents and our own technology, that becomes Indian, made in India technology that we can export. What we are doing is selling raw brains. So Sundar Pichai is a great guy, but he's not working for India, he's working for Google. And Google may well be like the East India Company. In fact, I have a chapter, a section called uh, the return of the East India Company. So wow. some, of these, some of these mega businesses that are so powerful, they are beyond the control of governments. They're not only fighting the Indian government, they're fighting the US government, the European Union. And so the governments versus private industry has become a big story Indians don't know about. Indians feel that if we complain about Twitter, to pata kya ho jayega. but Twitter is under inquiry. There are lawsuits against Google, against Facebook. There are antitrust cases in the US to break them up in Europe also. So, you know, one of the things that India has to do on the offensive is to monitor these groups, their use of data. Uh, the use of data is what allows the AI algorithms to become smart because without the data, the algorithm cannot learn. It's like, you know, a child needs to learn how things work in this house by looking at examples, by watching people, by looking at the reaction. 
and, and understanding how, how the behavior is and being able to predict. So the same way the machine learning happens by looking at a lot of examples of Indian people's behavior, who is right wing, who is left wing, who fights whom, who can be made to fight somebody, who can be made into a separatist, who can be made into a Punjab farmer that will be opposed to the government. You know, so they are monitoring and keeping track of individual profiles. So they have a profile on Ranavi, they have a profile on Rajiv, they have a profile on, uh, uh, you know, Sonia Gandhi, on Modi, all these kind of things. And they're looking at not only your social media footprint, but your Gmail, your emails, your messages to each other, uh, what you buy, your orders online. Uh, it, this eavesdropping and this surveillance is so sophisticated. And this is feeding the artificial intelligence models to map your brain and your thinking. So this India can stop. India can, uh, uh, the, the, the government that is furthest ahead in doing this is EU. And India can learn from EU. India is doing some of these things, lip service, there's a lot of debate, a lot of discussion. Some laws have been enacted, very little being enforced. And I've written a lot about how our people are actually selling out. Uh, a lot of Niti Aayog documents, Niti Aayog plans are actually drafted by Google. Imagine it's like the Raja inviting the East India Company to draft his strategy. Hmm. Saying ki, aap hi maabap hai, Aap ko jada pata hai. Aap hi, you know how to govern, you know how you are more civilized and more sophisticated and you have all this industrial technology. So you only draft a plan on how to, uh, how to uh, run my kingdom. So, you know, the way the East India Company was outsourcing, uh, had been outsourced the operation of the governments by many kings, uh, you are finding that uh, some of these modern uh, AI companies are beginning to take over not only simple things like messaging and whom you like and whom you don't like, but they are figuring out what you will speak on COVID, what you're allowed to speak, what you're not allowed to speak. Uh, you know, more than 50% of the videos I put up, and I put up two videos a week, and we have a pipeline with a lot of them recorded. More than 50% of the videos I put up get flagged as politically controversial, politically sensitive by these guys. And then my team has to go fight them and escalate it and get them to change it. By then, we've lost the momentum. And the reason they're doing it is on purpose, because there is a bias built into these, uh, these uh, international organizations that are doing all this mischief. So first, India, rather than exporting raw brains to these people, and these people use Indian brains to develop uh, intellectual property, patents, a lot of technology, which they then export back to India. They export all this back to India and we pay so much royalty, so much money to buy these guys, uh, buy their products. And it is these companies that are worth trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars today, uh, unprecedented. It's because of Indian brains. Indian brains have helped Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, you know, uh, uh, Apple, uh, Google, uh, Indian brains have helped the US Defense Department. So many defense contractors got Indian brains, Indian brains in NASA, in IBM. And you will find that when India buys the Rafael jet, why it buys the Rafael jet? Because it's got this technology of uh, multiple targets and it can do the job of 50 pilots sitting with only one pilot actually being needed to do the job of 50. It's doing all of that with the technology. A lot of it is AI technology. But when you go there and look at who's developing all this technology, you'll find a lot of Indians there. So, you know, our brains, hain, we are, those are not being used for India. They're, they are, on a personal level, they're making good money. I'm very proud and very happy for uh, Sundar Pichai. But don't think he's helping India. Don't think that he is a sign of Indian technology. He's a sign of American technology. He's part of the system. He's invested in it. They're making him into a rich guy, famous guy. And having an Indian face in front is a very convenient thing. It's a very convenient thing. So, so, you know, these are, these are sort of a new, it's a new kind of colonization going on, which Indians need to understand because we don't know how this colonization works and we think it's actually good for us because they've hired some of our people. So that is one thing India can end is just giving away all its talent rather than creating projects in India which, which Indians can follow. Second is data. Uh, the second thing that AI needs without which AI cannot function is data. Call, they call it big data which means that you go to Kumbh Mela and you can do surveillance on tens of millions of people, what jati, where they're from, what is their social demographic, uh, do they feel exploited, who likes whom, who hates whom, 
building a very complex map of social map of political problems tensions with each other religious tensions with each other and building this map of our such a huge part of india all of all the districts and villages are represented in the kumbh mela so that's like an example of how big data is being gathered big data is being gathered by these people based on looking at uh, the financial uh, you know all the financial information in india is being monitored by uh, american companies that are looking at credit rating credit rate your credit rating is in the hands of uh, uh, american companies so they know all your transactions and uh, they know your vulnerabilities they know whether you are a person that can be bribed because you got a problem or whether you are against somebody whether you are uh, whether you are fond of somebody because they maybe they've given you a loan so the big data the big data uh, is financial it is transactional based on what you are buying and selling it is messages that uh, social media messages it's the videos what you like what you don't like it's all your behavior uh, not only online but even offline lot of eavesdropping going on so india should on uh, first of all india should uh, stop this uh, you know uh, export of uh, raw brains that go and, and and big data that is then used to create ai sophisticated products and technologies which india then has to buy at a huge price so this is a very uh, sort solid thing then later i can discuss uh, if you are interested what are the positive projects india should do what are the projects besides saying ki unko nahi karna we going to stop them okay but what should we do what should we do with our big data what should we do with the lacks of talented people which we are not doing today so those are some of the ideas that i want to bring out and i'm bringing out a second volume and a third volume on my ai correct i'm so glad you're bringing up uh, big data it's one of those topics i have been dying to bring up on the show for a while uh, i also read somewhere that whoever controls the algorithm is actually controlling the power structure in the world and many yes yeah, many of the world's governments don't even understand this completely because possibly the people who are running the governments aren't honestly i mean for lack of a better way to put it they are not tech savvy so they are not kind of forcing how the power is actually going to shift to these privately owned organizations like google amazon facebook etc and you know while we shit all over china there is some stuff to admire that country for which is that they probably for they were able to see the future a little bit maybe in the 90s the 2000s they were able to predict that this will happen therefore they didn't allow a google and a facebook to establish itself in china and they had their own government controlled uh, websites and companies perfect perfect so so uh, i've written a lot on this also you know indian outsourcing was good a good way to create a middle class by renting mm. brains but china also did uh, created its middle class by renting cheap factory labor cheap fa- they did manufacturing cheap factory labor big difference is china decided that between 25% and 50% of all the profits made by renting out cheap factory labor all of that money should be reinvested in chinese own technology to compete against the americans so they would copy the american uh, who set up a factory there they would copy this idea and they would create their own technology and they would invest the profits they are making to, to to build their own technology for the future now indian tcs should have done that you know this uh, infosys should have done that uh, uh, all these companies that made tons of money they just took that money and uraud it and made good share price and lot of people made money suppose 50% or let's say even 25% or let's say even 10 15% of all the billions of dollars that the indian software exporters made suppose ray back from the 90s they had been putting it into a fund to invest in future technologies futurist technology see china because they did it now china is number 1 in many parts of ai and in some parts they are number 2 to the us they are number 1 in solar panels they are number 1 in robotics you know they have more robots than uh, any other country they have more solar panel market share than anyone else they are catching up with us in uh, semiconductors uh, if you look at uh, avionics if you look at so many fields and ai means a collect cluster of technologies it's not just one technology there is a pure ai but it is connected with all these other technologies and that's the way i use the term so if you look at there are eight or 10 major technologies that are under this ai umbrella china invested in all of them they made very good bets you know these are these are this is where government vision is needed you bring government and industry together 
you bring your industrialists in line and tell them, okay, you can all make a lot of money, but this is what you got to do. Yeah. So yeah. the rules of the big game were made by the Chinese that, okay, we will send our students to America. And when uh, the difference between uh, Chinese students and Indian students coming to America is 90, some 95% of the Chinese students go back. And Indian students, most of them stay. So as an individual, India is, Indian is doing well. A Chinese is more doing uh, well as a collective. As a, the, as a Rashtra, they're doing much better. Indians have more, a lot of billionaires here, they're both famous hoge log. In every field, Indians are doing very well. But that is not helping India as a nation. So China did what you are saying. Uh, they got the benefit of uh, outsourcing and quick, easy money. But they also reinvested long term. They did not just do short term jugaad. I think the Indians got stuck in short term jugaad. Okay, mere paas ye quarterly profit itna hai, annual profit itna hai, aapka itna hai. So they didn't think, hey, man, I'm going to sacrifice short term profit because we're doing well. I'll sh- sacrifice a little bit of short term profit and put it into long term research. Jiska paanch, das saal ke baad fayda hoga. Even in India, most patents that are being filed in this kind of technology are being filed by Microsoft India, Google India. It is the, it is the Western people who have set up shop in India to, uh, to leverage the Indian brain. And, and we are very happy that they have jobs create jobs. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, no problem. But every place where there is a Microsoft India, China, they have put their own knowledge in China. Uh, their own or wo se knowledge nikal kar, they are creating their own. So we don't have to do it dishonestly. We could do it honestly also. But uh, we, ha- we have not wanted to do that because that's long term. That is, uh, th- you know, investing in, investing in technology and intellectual property. Kya fayda hum American se le lenge, whatever the Americans give us, we'll take it. That kind of mentality of dependence uh, is not good. And you mentioned that uh, the American... Uh, uh, these uh, technology companies are becoming too powerful. I would I would point out the American government has a parallel in the Defense Department. There's something called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. DARPA is the inventor of internet. What it used to be called DARPA Net then became internet. DARPA has invented fiber optics. They, they were responsible for Bell Labs, uh, semiconductors, inventing the transistor. So DARPA has invented so many technologies. Uh, and and now in AI and all these new things, is private companies are doing it, but American government, Defense Department, CIA, they are also into this. And the Chinese are into it. Chinese are into it in a very big way. The uh, Chinese actually are also building the biggest the uh, the biggest uh, data, big data on genetics, on every individual genetics, uh, Indian genetics of this culture, that of this group, that group. African, every village, in you know, all this genetic mapping, which allows them, which allows them not to make diseases which are customized for a certain type of gene. It will the disease will not affect people in general, but affect people of this gene, or it will affect everybody but protect the people of this gene. This kind of genetic warfare, and then solutions based on based on genetics coming up with solutions to medical problems. China is at, a, is at the cutting edge of building a, a map of the human uh, genetics by country, by, ter- by you know, type of people, race, whatever. Uh, so, th- so this is where India is not a player. Yep. And India um, needs yeah. to become a player because we have brains and we have data like nobody because we have so much diversity. We have genetic diversity. We have cultural diversity. Uh, you know, people are taking our our, not our data and making things out of it. We ought to be doing that. So I think the positive solution would be government should say, okay, all these tech companies, you should start putting away 10% into high, into futurist technologies. After five, after three years, you'll be required to put away 20%. And maybe thereafter, we will make it like 30%. So you sacrifice your short-term profit. So what on uh, uh, Sensex if you are not always doing great? But uh, you'll be still doing very well. But a certain amount of your profit will go into futuristic things. And maybe these futuristic things, government should give them a tax break. Maybe government should say you'll have a tax holiday for 10 years. You you invest your profit in these list of technologies. They give a list. These are sensitive to national security. These should not be in foreign hands. These should be in our hands. Government should do that. 
and then government should say we'll procure from india make in india we'll procure yep uh, i think the big problem that encapsulates everything you said pretty much is indian brain drain uh, and brain drain is a bigger problem now than it's ever been uh, if there's even 10 kids who are listening to this or contemplating going abroad 10 really smart kids who are contemplating going abroad and then they change their mind because of this podcast i feel the job will be done uh stay back build here uh i also remember being pissed off at the concept of brain drain in college over time i kind of made peace with it because i realized everyone has their own journeys but now once i've learned geopolitics i'm starting to get a little upset about the concept of brain drain again because i feel like indian families celebrate job placements and stable stability and um you know just good salaries way more than they should celebrate being able to create jobs and being able to go aggressive in your own career and being able to chase instability you know seek discomfort as the internet calls it indian families should start celebrating these concepts and then you'll see a reduction in brain drain stop celebrating the fact that some indian has become a ceo in some foreign company and start celebrating the fact that oh wow here's zerodha a bootstrapped indian company which has made it big Here's Kunal Chah's cred, which is his second company after Free Charge. Celebrate Indian entrepreneurs more and change culture that way. That's that's what I believe will be a part of the solution. But sir, I also believe that there are a lot of young Indian kids in cities who are now not looking at okay, I've done my engineering, now I'm going to go to USA to study. The kind of thinking of the country as a whole again. Good. I am very happy to know that, uh, and I do know that. And some of them write to me, call me, and they want to be mentored. They want ideas, and I'm always there. this needs to be supported by big investments so mm-hmm. you know the thing is this venture capital if you look at venture capital in india for these ultimate tech, these high technology companies majority of the indian venture capital going into things like ai comes from chinese and american venture capital firms chinese have been blocked to some extent not entirely they are still operating to middle east and to singapore indirectly they're operating but most of many of the new investments have been stopped old investments continue but and the americans are very active in uh, bringing all their uh, venture capital skills so the company may be an indian entrepreneur but jo uske investor hai wo they is a uh, is a uh, you know uh, kleiner perkins from uh, america or some big uh, venture capital firm whatever uh, the point is that ultimately uh, they will they are buying him out he his his dream is to his dream is to build a company where his shares will be worth 100 million and the venture capitalists will buy him out or google will buy him out lot of indian companies which are run by indian entrepreneurs in india the venture money comes from either private firms of the united states or somewhere else or from venture capital firms international banks and so on now why isn't india able to put its own venture capital are we it is not we are not talking about thousands of crores i mean we, we, we yes we are talking about some thousands of crores big projects also but we are also talking about uh, in the hundreds of crores uh, little ventures these you know india should create a very large number of uh, local uh, sources of funding why don't states do that ek to central government ko kyu blame karna hai are bhai state wale they could take a certain amount of state funding uh, they could do some some way to raise some funds and uh, make it available to these entrepreneurs the kind of people you are talking about i am very proud of them young people who want to do this but they need help and they they need financial help they need to they need to be first of all you see first of all they need to be mega projects jaise isro ke we are going to put uh, so we are going to be uh, among the top 2 or 3 in the world in putting up satellites uh, in and in doing this that 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 uh, you know and then Uh, you look at an example like john f kennedy said in uh, early in the early 60s that by the end of this decade we'll put a man on the moon actually usa did not have a program to do a, any such thing mm. they had no program they had their whole goal at that time when he said it was to uh, go into orbit only but he set that goal and sure enough by the end of the decade americans walked on the moon so you know you put these big challenges so india needs to take a challenge and say okay we are going to create the a competitor to gpt3 and that's a technical thing i don't i mean we can discuss some other time but we are going to create a competitor to gpt3 which is at least as good maybe so many times better and we are going to do it in 3 years 
or, or five years. So they should set goals like that. And this requires so many billion dollars. We're going to create a team. So Aja, jitne bhi hamare bright log hai, come join us. This is like the equivalent of the American space program. Mm -hmm. uh, what is called now nowadays is called the moonshot, which means that a moonshot is something where you know you're 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 going after the moon, and this is such a high target. Even if you did not succeed in the process of doing it, many, many inventions will be made. Yeah. You know, when America had this moonshot, that is how they miniaturized and came up with semiconductors. All the semiconductors you have today, which is miniaturizing on and on. The American space program did a lot of that. American space program created many spin-off technologies, which are now the world uh, whole tech, tech system is, you know, would be impossible without those technologies. So when you do, a, India needs to do its moonshot. Yeah. India needs to have three or four, and I have project ideas. Then India needs to have a few moonshot scale technology projects to capture the imagination of its young people, give a huge amount of funding, and the benefits of uh, intellectual property that will come, it will take five to 10 years. It is not next election, but it, the benefits you will get by the end of this decade will be huge. India needs to do that. I do not see that vision. The only community in India, and I've talked to all kinds of people uh, in the context of my book, the only community in India which understands this strategic thinking are the defense people. I feel very happy when I talk to Navy people, Army people, Air Force people. They get it like that because, you know, they're very practical and they see what's happening in the world. They get it that, you know, we, we, better, uh, we better do our own... Uh, uh, technologies, we can't just go on buying Raphael type things forever and ever because it's costing more and more money. Again, at its core, sir, I believe it's a matter of leadership and direction. You need yes. a core of 100 really, really motivated visionary people. Uh, and we see that, you know, with the young corporate leaders of the country. I have a, a friend called Mr. Ashok Ramchand. He's a mentor to me. I have another mentor called uh, Mrs. Radhika Gupta. She's at Edelweiss. Uh, I see the way these people think versus say an older CEO in the country and the thinking is different. Age 60 versus age 40, Indian, the thinking is different. Age 40 versus age 28, which is my age, I see the thinking is different. And then when I compare people my age to the Gen Zs, the 18, 19 year olds, uh, I won't say that they're completely motivated and driven yet, but a lot of that potential is there. They're very intelligent and they're able to understand what's happening and they have a worldview. So I feel the Gen Z of India actually holds the keys. You know, the kids who are in college listening to this podcast now, absorbing all this information, when they are out in the real world as professionals, they will understand the concept of venture capital better. They'll understand the concepts of geopolitics better. Yes. So that's my big hope, sir. Uh, I still feel we are going in a good direction overall as a nation in terms of intellect. Uh, you know, again, the beautiful thing is, yes, our education system is highly criticized, but we're still smart people. And now we're starting to learn from the internet, hopefully from podcasts like this one. So, so could you elaborate a little more on what could possibly go wrong from what you said? I understood that you mean a fragmentation of India will take place where the country might get divided into more countries or, you know, pieces of the country will be taken away and absorbed into other countries. And that's honestly something that a lot of people need to wrap their brains around the international borders that we know of today have just been around for like hundred years or so. What was happening before the year 1900? What was happening before the year 1500? What was happening in human history of two lakh years? There was no such concept as borders. So this border of India that we all see in our geography textbooks, it's actually a very new concept. This border of Pakistan you see is a new concept. And it's very likely that these will change further. And it's just such a larger than life concept that we are not taught is possible in school, but we're probably on the brink of it. Therefore, the question to you is you said that as an economic power and as a geographical power, we might take a hit. But could you elaborate a little more on that? So okay, what can actually happen? Yeah. So I think China can take over the mountain areas. Uh, China is getting ready for it. They have built these high-speed rails all the way to the border, uh, whether it is Arunachal area, Bhutan area, Ladakh area, uh, you know, uh, all these different areas, Sikkim area. Uh, and, and even though 50% of the whole uh, border, northern border, is neutral because of Nepal. Not even counting Nepal, the rest of the border. You know, India has the largest, let me give you a statistic. 
India has the world's largest hostile border. You know, in the number of miles with Pakistan and China and, you know, all of these different areas, uh, which are hostile, where there is a territorial claim by an enemy, where there is armed forces of the enemy, nuclear powers, no other country in the world has that many thousand kilometers of hostile borders. So this is a huge risk that is going, that is depleting India's GDP, depleting so, you know, if India didn't have to uh, put so many troops in Kashmir, uh, the, the GDP compounded growth, growth rate would have been such that today's uh, per capita income would have been substantially higher, maybe two, three times what it is, if you were to simulate and take, say, okay, uh, uh, the GDP would have been so many percent higher than it was. So we are paying the price of uh, uh, this, this very expensive protection of our sovereignty. You know, we have to do, we have to export so much uh, manpower, tech, uh, software manpower. Uh, why? Because we are, there are two things we buy. One is we buy petroleum. Thank, thank God the price of oil has been stable. But we spend a lot of our foreign exchange buying two things, uh, weapons and petroleum. And so without these two, we, you, know, you need the energy to run your industry and run your life. And you need the weapons to protect you from enemies. So, you know, it's like we are on a treadmill. So we have to keep exporting. Uh, a few years from now, we have to export twice as many people because each person brings in so much uh, foreign exchange or uski because we need to protect ourselves. So this is not a stable, uh, this, kind of a, this kind of a sovereignty is not stable where it depends on foreign weapons without which we can't succeed because our weapons have not been able to come up at the rate at which China has advanced. And China is giving, so not only China is threatening to take over the mountain areas and these mountain areas where the rivers are. So mountain area is not just some random nostalgia and romantic mountain. That's where the rivers are. Whether it is the Brahmaputra, whether it is the all this whole, uh, you know, uh, the, the northeast rivers that come through uh, uh, Ladakh and Kashmir, uh, three of the five Punjab rivers are being given to Pakistan, uh, including uh, the most, uh, the high, biggest river, biggest rivers, uh, small amount of the water is coming to India only. So the takeover of the mountains has huge implications for the economy. So while I have a zillion questions after every single answer of yours, I'm trying to curate this as an introduction piece to you because I'm sure you'll be back on the show. Uh, therefore, let's talk about something that's relevant. Uh, we had someone called Mr. Abhijit Chavda on the show. I believe even you know him and you guys have interacted uh, in the recent past as well. He is also very fascinated and uh, into geopolitics in general. And he keeps bringing up this concept about COVID being a man-made virus, uh, COVID-19 being a man-made virus. Um, and early on in this episode, you spoke about how the Chinese have succeeded in mapping out the human genome in terms of they have a genetic mapping of how an Indian's Indian gene is, how an African gene is, how an American gene is. Therefore, they can kind of curate biological weapons that only affect a certain part of our population. So the obvious question, again, this is because you study geopolitics in such a wide way. And I'm sure you've also delved a little bit into bioweapons in your studies. I'd love to know about biological warfare in general, the future of it. The obvious question is also the coronavirus. Is it man-made? Is it being deployed in order to pull up China's GDP while the rest of the world's GDP is kind of plateauing? You know, it's very interesting. Very early in the pandemic, uh, in one of my, in more than one of my uh, uh, talks on YouTube, I actually raised this. In fact, I did research on the Wuhan Institute, where this whole uh, is one of the top institutes of viruses, and they have a huge uh, amount of uh, work going on. Americans actually collaborated with them. Americans unwittingly taught them a lot of stuff, uh, gave them grants because the, the Chinese always said that we are the center of our research on bats and the coronavirus. This institute in Wuhan is well known for that. I had uh, pictures, I had some uh, articles that they have written. They have written, they have written, published papers on uh, on the uh, man-made versus natural viruses. Papers with that title. 
that they did later withdrew. So I put a lot of this stuff on in the early days of my, uh, when the virus came and I was talking about that subject. Uh, this was uh, dismissed. Uh, these uh, YouTube, for Facebook type people would ban all of these kind of things. And people in India also did not uh, react well. They thought I'm being a conspiracy theorist, so I stopped. Now it has come back in a big way. I actually think there's a lot to be said that that is the case. I, I actually believe that uh, I'm not sure that the Chinese had the strategy that we'll do this on purpose and release it, because if that had been the case, they would have protected themselves a little bit better. Uh, uh, but my feeling is that uh, it was some kind of an experiment. They are doing some R&D. And some, there are these mishaps that happen in virus research all the time. When you're dealing with dangerous pathogens, this is not the first time that something has escaped and gone out of hand. So I think this was probably a technology being developed. It had not been finalized. It had probably not reached the stage where uh, President Z pushed the button and said, okay, now go with it. It was sort of happening when it accidentally leaked out. I think that's probably the case. So it was kind of a semi-finished incomplete kind of a virus job are not truly perfected to do what it uh, what it could do even more dangerously and it somehow leaked out and then it's gone uh, i feel that that's a scenario i don't have any proof for it but i have a lot of uh, uh, information some of it publicly known and some you know the cia mon has a huge amount of uh, huge repository of uh, documents on china and they have a, they they keep translating those from mandarin chinese to english and some of it they make available to certain people from the outside, and some of it they classify it. So I'm also an avid reader of that. Uh, and, and I feel that uh, uh, whether the world can publicly ever admit and acknowledge and whether they can do anything to China, we, we don't know. But the fact is that uh, it, it, is, it is unlikely that with no human involvement, this thing magically appeared in some, pack, in some fish market animal market and from there it went all the way i think there is a human element whether it is intentional or unconsciously accidental uh, whether it was part of a big government plan or just some research going on to investigate that i don't know but what is more important than the past is it is now abundantly clear that such technologies are within the power and within the control of uh, labs but look, whether whether Ranveer, you were doing it or not on purpose, now we know that you have the capability to do it again in the future. Different formulations, different mutations. See, that is what I'm saying. So now I know this, now I know this, I'm using you as a kind of a mirror, but I'm saying I'm really referring to China, that now that we know about China, that they, they this happened, even if it turns out this happened unintentionally, the point is the capability exists. It can be done intentionally. It can be done consciously. It can be done that, okay, this will only affect African people or it will affect everybody except African people. Because, you know, what they are, if you look at what is the mRNA, uh, this thing that uh, Moderna and uh, Pfizer, that Americans, very successful, very successful vaccines because they're using a technology which is genetic oriented. And so you can build an immunity uh, uh, to a certain uh, mutant, which will be not uh, applicable to another mutant. You can build a mutant which is going to attack only a certain type of genetic makeup. Uh, you know, the genetic medicine, genetically controlled medicine for good purposes, good uh, positive use, is a huge industry. So you can now have medicines that will only go to a certain organ in your body or it will only influence people of certain genes. Uh, you, you can t look at, uh, there's something, to you can clip, edit scissors, with scissors. Uh, you can edit the genetic. You can know that this part of the gene is vulnerable to these kind of things and you can remove them, which means you can also add them. If, you, if, if there's a genetic thing which, which protects you from certain disease. See, some genetic uh, 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 substance makes you vulnerable to a certain disease, so certain people are more vulnerable than others. But by the same token, there are certain genetic things somebody has this in them, which will protect them from a certain disease. So now that we know, and this knowledge is exploding, this is exploding as this is big data. Genetic data is the ultimate big data. And this is going into all these machine learning systems and they're figuring out these things faster than human beings could figure out. 
Mm. So this is this means that this new tech, new age of bio and and AI, the the marriage of biological sciences and computer science. Computer science, learning how the biology works from the biologists, neurology, neuroscience, teaching them how the mind works. Remember all these uh, AI systems are called neural networks. Why are they called neural networks? Neural, neural is the human brain because it's modeled after that. It's inspired based on our understanding of the neural system. So neural system for mind sciences and uh, biological systems for physical interventions. This is the future, a large part of the future of computer science. I'm a computer scientist by training and my field was artificial intelligence. And I'm telling you that the biggest bonanza or the biggest opening of uh, computer science for intellectual property and research has come in these life sciences, both in the in, in neuroscience to, uh, uh, for mental, inter mental interventions uh, and also through uh, the, the genetics for biological interventions. So the future is so promising in positive ways and so scary in negative ways. Uh, India has to be at the top of all this. India is not at the top of all this. And this is scary that you, you end up as a, if, you, if India were to, I feel that Indians are smart. And if India were to set a target of what, what we'll achieve in terms of made in India, AI based life sciences, technologies, and other kinds of technologies, what will we achieve by 2025, 2027, 2030, and put some serious brains and just like ISRO, leave them alone. Don't center it in Delhi where ministers are going and messing around every day. Keep this out of Delhi somewhere and put some serious people, serious money. You will, you will solve all these problems. You will bring brilliant people to work. Like one of the things that happened in NASA is all kind of physicists from all over the world came and, you know, all these uh, rocket scientists who used to work in Germany, and they wanted to run away from Hitler. They all came to the United States. So NASA is able to harness the brains from everywhere. Russians, I, some low guy. Now India can create similar to ISRO and similar to NASA, but in this new field that I'm talking about. Yep. It can create two or three ISROs and give them missions and give them money and have them the freedom to think on their own, technocrats. I would love to be involved just, just for fun, just to mentor, just to give my input. And I want nothing out of it. I don't want position, position. I don't want title, title. I don't want to be running anything. I just want to help. Yeah. And this, this would be a good thing to do. I have three things to say, sir. Uh, the first is a recent article I read on the Manhattan Project. And for people who are listening into the on the podcast, the Manhattan Project was the project related to creating the atom bomb. And what sir just spoke about where the physicists left Europe because they would either be recruited by Hitler or recruited by the allied forces, which is USA and uh, UK. So they decided to go on the USA side because they felt like that's the more ethical side. That's where uh, there weren't the concentration camps. And the reason they joined the Manhattan Project is because they figured that if we don't get together and create an atom bomb, someone else on the other side will. And then it will be deployed on the USA and on all the allied forces. So let's side with the good. And that's a great way of looking at the times we live in as well. Intelligent Indians need to, especially those who are in the field of AI, need to come back to India and develop things here for exactly the same reason that sir is listed out in the podcast. So that's the first thing that I think the modern day Manhattan project. The second thing I'd like to highlight uh, is uh, I think that, that this is the main reason, honestly, that a bunch of my co-founders and myself are chasing big business in life to be able to fund projects like this and to fund opportunity like this in India. So I hope that we're on the right track. Uh, but the third thing, sir, most specifically, like I, I know you broke down how uh, the biggest use of big data is in biology, where a lot of people believe that medicine has already learned everything about the human body, but that's not true. There's a lot of mysteries about the human body that are yet to be discovered. And that's probably where AI will be used in a beautiful way. But since you studied AI, since you studied uh, biotech, what other kind of uh, technologies are we on the brink of, according to you, which will kind of just create a very, very different world by the year 2031, according to you? Like what else is out there? So, you know, what's happening is if you, one of the things I did in my book, 
uh, I uh, this is uh, this book. I, I'll just show it up there. Uh, Artificial intelligence and the future of power. Now, one of the uh, tables I have here is I'm looking at the location where the technology is based. From is it outside the body? Is it inside the body? And how it's moving? So there's a there's a table somewhere here uh, where I'm actually uh, looking at. Uh, um, so so yeah, this is a table on page 21. So what I'm looking at is that uh, certain technology. It starts out on a web, so you can go to the web and you can enter something and it'll translate in Hindi or whatever. It's some technology. There, then the technology can be brought onto your device, uh, you, your laptop or your mobile device. You can do the same thing. You don't have to go online. You can do it. And then it becomes a wearable. So from a handheld, it goes even more intimate, becomes a wearable. Uh, nowadays, the watch is a big wearable. There's going to be augmented reality goggles. That will also be a wearable, but it's still outside the body. It's not inside my skin. It's touching my skin. Wearable is touching the skin, uh, and it's all the time on me. Uh, or almost all the time. Uh, now it's going to go even further. It's going to go inside the body. Mm -hmm. So the implants are being done. We, we find uh, Elon Musk is uh, very famous for his, his ventures and he, one of his latest ventures is very, he thinks this is the biggest breakthrough that will happen is AI based uh, in, in implants. Neuralink. So, uh, yes. And, and the U US government is investing in that in a huge way. Their parallel thing CIA has, Chinese have. So American corporates, again, three people. American corporates, American government, military, CIA, second, and Chinese. These three are investing in this. And what they are what they have done so far is very quite remarkable. They are able to uh, the, these uh, these uh, devices inside are able to recognize that you're about to get angry uh, wow. uh, because there's a certain burst of neurons. And so they can anticipate uh, and maybe maybe control your anger, maybe maybe put in a burst which is a happy burst, some happy memory that you had, so that uh, your uh, violence is controlled. Uh, they can they they are working on ways that they can detect, uh, uh, you know, a person is about is suicidal, so he's about to get this kind of a negative thought, and maybe they can intervene. So there are positive applications. It will be sold initially to the market to the world. Head me, I'm going to put this implant for good reasons. It will help you, sir. If you are a depressed person, you are bipolar, uh, you are suicidal, you are you have anger. Maybe the court will also say that you are. Uh, if somebody has committed some violence, uh, maybe domestic violence, then instead of throwing him in jail, he has to accept that there will be an implant to protect to prevent that. So, if a person were given a choice in a court that you are either going to be in jail because you are a violent fellow, or you're going to have this implant that will keep you non-violent. A lot of people say, hey, I'm better off getting this implant because mm. I'm told they give you free Netflix also. They give you free Netflix and they give you free porn and they give you all kind of fun stuff when you put the implant. So, okay, I'll live in this nice land, fantasy land. So, this business of putting implants that will do what instead of augmented realities from the outside. So, from an implant, the inside they're going to give you an augmented reality, virtual reality. At first, it will be to or just prevent, prevent bad things from happening. Uh, maybe, and then they'll find that this can enhance your learning. You can learn math more. You can become, uh, you know, um, know many languages. So, there will be a lot of good applications. And, and always, always technology has found good ways to be acceptable. And once acceptable, once more and more people are into this, it's become fashion almost. Almost you go to a cocktail party and say, hey, I have this chip. And the other guy will say, I have this big chip. And this guy will say, I have this Facebook chip. And the other guy will say, I got this Elon Musk. This is a new one. I got that one. So the way we show off with the, who got what kind of phone, smartphone or watch, uh, maybe these implants will become highly fashionable. Uh, and even if they are not fashionable, then you know there are still uh, U.S. is uh, uh, developing implants. This has come on many shows also, uh, where they will inject something into the body of the soldier uh, who is in the front, and this will monitor his biochemistry, his blood levels, and if something is going to go wrong, it will anticipate well before any other method would have anticipated. So this is a way to keep the soldiers ha healthy. This is a way to uh, you know, anticipate problems. 
there is a company in mumbai that has a blood test where it can predict cancer one year if you're going to get cancer in the next year exactly which kind of cancer the very original kind of work they have done it's also been done in europe and us similar kind of things but now the implants the implant will be kind of like a permanent surveillance of your biochemistry another kind of an implant will be a permanent surveillance of your neural network and mind so i feel that uh, uh, these are technologies that are not 50 years from now this is by 2030 these are realistic these are commercial uh, these are things that will have uh, will be marketed so where is india in all this this troubles me because this yeah. is the industrial revolution scale change in the world new colonies new colonizers within the countries haves and have nots now what we are talking about and what we have not talked about as a problem in india is india's own people being classified as haves and have nots on a new scale you know we already have the disparity but imagine half the people in india barely educated i mean many are illiterate officially those who are literate they're not functionally literate i mean like the driver of my mother's car my mother's no more but he's he's like family we are all he's living there and he's like our the son in the house he is hardly educated but he's classified as an educated person because he can read and write his name that is the definition mm-hmm. of education but when you talk about if he cannot function as an educated person and and get the job that requires some education he cannot do that i would say half of indian people are not functionally competitive on a global scale i mean they can do menial tasks very labor intensive tasks they can do some handicraft or whatever they can do now that's a very large population that's hundreds of millions of people so So what is going to happen to the large, uh, you know, social demographic group uh, that uh, we cannot afford to have? Uh, you know, we cannot afford to uh, give so many, so much housing and free gas and free education and free medical and uh, you know all kind of uh, facilities that human beings need. And of course, since we have these people, we have to do. We should give them. But if we did not have such a large population of the poor kind. if we had you know then your thinking would be correct that the youth of india the one you are talking about are the well educated youth of india and the new industrialists those are well educated and the new leaders you're talking about that but you are not you are not acknowledging that those are like the top 20% 25% uh, then then there is another one third somewhere in the middle who are okay maybe they can cross over but there's a good half who are not likely in the next generation to cross over i mean this is a very big job india did not educate its people and uh, this is a big crisis i i want to i want people to tell me what is going to happen to the lower half of india so but at you a don't time, at, at you a time don't, when the upper half is jumping ahead don't you think internet penetration will play a role in like educating them as well because let's forget the education system that's it's it's like kind of a dead beast but the internet is like a beast by itself so that's my big hope even for them yeah but even that requires internet based education internet based tutoring mentoring guiding a student it cannot just be that you give them internet and the guy is just watching porn movies and netflix and tamasha and cricket most of these guys uh, you know most of the people in that level that i'm talking about uh, they are using internet more more or less like one tamasha uh, creating followers uh, getting friends you know they can it is not serious education it is not it is not for that i mean you'll find that the number of people who subscribe for a course which is not a trivial course which is got something serious about it even if it is free the number of people is maybe thousands or lakhs but then compare it with the number of people in the millions who are just looking at junk yep so internet internet also needs to be uh, it does not it, it need the curating of internet uh, uh, and giving some incentives to people and they should be they should be on a track to learn uh that also requires some thinking and strategy yeah um like that's one of the problems we're trying to solve on one of our projects we're trying to create a product that teaches people and entertains people at the same time i can't reveal much of it on the show but uh, it's it's a product to solve exactly this problem that how do we kind of make the process of learning fun for the average indian yeah. See, um, the, traditionally this was called edutainment educational yeah. enter- entertainment and edutainment also has gone into the gaming 
Yeah. So you can you can make games. I I, I used to make games I, way back oh, wow. uh, as a programmer. So I know all this gaming stuff. Uh, I, I'm deep into this uh, the ethos of gaming for good purposes. Wow. Uh, you can you can you can create you can make game. I even have a, a book coming out. I will reveal a little bit where I'm describing the cosmos as a game. Oh oh my god. <laughs> and, and this is a Vedic view, by the way. The cosmos is a game. Wow. The whole startup. Evolution, enhancement, dissolution, start up again. I'm modeling as a game. Wow! For fun, this is just my my. Uh, this is Bhagwan's Leela, which is a game. <laughs> Bhagwan's yeah. Leela is a is a, <laughs> is the most ultimate game. Yeah. Once you figure out some of the uh, some of the crucial aspects of uh, the Leela as a game. Then you figure out how. What if I put these in my my game for human beings, mm. my man-made game? I will copy some of what Bhagwan has done, and this is absolutely incredible. Mm. Because because uh, the 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 what is called stickiness, you know what is the the stickiness in in the in this Leela is absolutely amazing because people are really into what pursuing this, pursuing that. So suppose we can figure out the core tenets. What is the tatwa of this game? that gets wow. people going into life so seriously and if you can capture that and put it into a game where we can modify their thinking in a good way what a big thing so i am yeah. into that so interesting that you're bringing up these topics sir uh, it is going to be our main theme on the hindi episode that we will shoot right after this but uh, coming back to you know this topic about educating the future of the country um let me ask you a simple question sir don't even think too hard about it just give me a one line answer what's your favorite movie of all time are wah you know my movies have changed over time uh, uh but I, I, uh, i would say the one movie that uh, inspired me that i felt was saying something that i was working on was the movie lagan hmm. because i felt Uh, i felt this idea that uh, you know uh, we are being ruled by rules by laws that somebody else made uh, whether we have to play cricket and win and all that for our existence now what was the game of cricket that somebody brought and we have to play whether we win or lose but our survival is at stake now these ai giants are making the rules of the game yeah, the, yeah. the new game is not cricket only the cricket but these games your social media is gamified yeah. so how you respond will determine uh, whether you become famous or not how well your channel does so it's a way of training you you are being trained the algorithm is training you the owner of the technology trains the algorithm with big data that is yeah. part one uh, somebody trains the algorithm put his own bias and his own values into it then the algorithm manages all these people trains them to behave accordingly Hmm. so so the chinese have got this algorithms to train this muslim minority in their re- in one region of the country and make them good chinese citizens they get rewards if they don't they get punished and they they have now taken this gamification of uh, chinese of the muslims and applied it to the general society so all chinese citizens are being gamified uh, and 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 uh, american uh, uh, citizens the social media is a gamification system uh, mike uh, this uh, Zuckerberg announced that uh, uh, now it will be allowed to uh, uh, discuss Wuhan as a possible origin, the Wuhan lab, man-made lab, as a possible origin of the virus. Previously, it was not allowed. Now, who the hell is he? Who the hell is he to decide for two billion people, large percent of human beings, that this will be allowed and that will not be allowed? And then, when they are when they are accused of false content, they say, "Oh, we are not responsible for content." You can't have it both ways. If you are censoring. if you are blocking people like they are blocking my channels a lot if you are blocking people then you are taking responsibility over content you are taking a stand on what is right content what is wrong content then in that case when the content is dangerous and irresponsible you are also dis- uh, you know your 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 neck on the line so i feel that uh, uh, the the this uh, uh, the, the movie the movie that influenced me uh, in a way that i could take its lesson not just entertainment in a historical context in the past i can take its lesson and apply it to the future i can mm. say this same game is being played now 
Yeah. In a in a in a in a virtual sense, is yeah. we are being gamified just like those guys had to play cricket and beat the people who made the game. And maybe we will learn how to do our own social media and learn how to beat all these guys like Lagan. They beat in them in cricket in the end. Yep. So we, we got to we got to we got to learn from Lagan and figure out okay now how how do we create that kind of a ragtag team with very little resources but a tremendous amount of willpower a tremendous amount of confidence and courage and all that and look at the team everybody was uh, optimized for his role. This guy is a tough guy, so he'll be doing this. This guy is not so tough, but he'll be doing that. Everybody doing a role. So I feel that India needs to be India needs to create Team India. We need to have a team, uh, a Bharat team, home team. I called it. We need to have a home team that is savvy about all these challenges and not afraid, facing squarely and out to win, and yeah. learning, and and we need to put all the resources into it. Yeah. The reason I asked you about the movie. is because i feel everyone's favorite movie is the piece of art where they find themselves in the most where they say okay that's me that's me on screen that's what i want to do that's where i see myself and one way to educate the masses is through amazing storytelling so going forward i mean i really feel there's a need for entrepreneurial stories and inspirational stories in indian cinema rather than the ladka ladki hero villain kind of stuff we need to be able to create more movies like lagan like guru things like so that so i i i feel that i am the uh, i am the person with a vision ki against all odds main ye cricket team bana dunga mm. aur hum unko hum unko dikhayenge we'll show them we'll beat them at their own game i want to do that for this new ai internet cyber big data game that is the new game and i want to do the lagan version uh, uh, hopefully during my life but certainly i'd like to inspire people that this work continues so that would that is why i find such movies because i can use the metaphor and move it up 20 30 years and say okay today the metaphor can be applied in this way yeah uh, and i see it happening there is a huge need for inspiring content for this exact reason that if we want more indians to be risk takers we want more indians to be job creators it has to happen through storytelling uh, so we'll be moving on to the final section of this particular episode think of this as sort of a rapid fire section it's all our questions from our twitter verse uh, you were kind enough to retweet our uh, tweet about questions for you so this is the best of the lot you've got your own cult following that's one thing i can tell you from seeing all the questions so uh, let me begin with our twitter verse section and there's there's a lot of questions honestly um okay uh Wow. Okay. Aman Morya asks. Overall, if you had to choose between a positive and a negative future of India, what do you think is more likely? Considering all the data that you have in your head, which side are we tilting on more? Well, I'm very sorry that uh, I I can't give the good news to make people feel good. I've been doing the good news most of my life as an act in this area, saying that we want to build this great Indian grand narrative. and i've been working on it and documenting india's great achievements and all that that is very important to do that's past the question is can we project it into the future and i i feel that the the number the the percent of people like the ones on this show and you as a host and many other wonderful people they are on the right tri- track but i'm not sure that the that they have enough percentage share of uh, mind of the indian mind in the resources and i'm particularly worried that there's a bottom 50% that are not even in the discussion they don't even know what the heck is going on they're just looking for basic dal roti get a job learn to be a little bit of a low middle class fellow in a city and live leave the village life there's an abandonment of villages because the agricultural economy is not able to support villages there are so many people who are doing the uh, five six people doing the job that one person could do uh, in a city like delhi in a domestic case in a domestic situation because they have i mean you ask them why aren't you working in your village they have no no economy there's no way to survive so this uh, su- this is a very serious problem i do not know how the uh, india can simultaneously solve the china problem the pakistan problem the domestic breaking india forces the overpopulation with 50% under under the uh, under the level where 
they're not able to sustain themselves they need to be supported maybe maybe at some point there'll be a unit of entrepreneurs leading the charge if the babus and the government governance can't uh handle it it's you an interest that. yeah i mean that's that's the big hope and that's the vision i have for myself in 2000 29 and 2030 that okay we would have got some capital from whatever we're building now and then it's all about training the next generation of entrepreneurs mm. um there's a follow up very interesting follow up question from captain jack sundaram how do we create futuristic thinkers out of the young generation of indians wonderful so i can only tell you my process, my journey was uh, i was a deep meditator so that got that puts you in touch with some creative source inside there's an infinite infinite supercomputer with all the ai and all the brilliance that is uh, in all of us that is an app that we we are born with uh, we have we have that kind of innate intelligence we need to learn how to tap into that and i had the i had i was blessed with this gift uh, uh, and, and this was encouraged and developed further by several spiritual masters during my early middle life Uh, and so my ability to think big to connect the dots to figure out this thing has a, a cause effect relationship with that thing it looks like it's unrelated but not so this, if you change this it will change that is a big cause effect uh, relationship that ability to think on a large canvas uh, multi level some of the moving parts are not even visible they are beneath the surface i got it early childhood lot of such insights through meditation the second is i so i would i would encourage young people to get into a meditation program because it will expand your mind it will make you a smarter person i mean if the americans have, have picked up indian meditation in the last 25 years and proven that you can have better athletes and you can have better mathematics and you can you can have better musicians why are we not using it as a central part so we should this a it's a it's a remarkable thing second thing is develop a reading habit and and just be furiously reading other people's thoughts whether it's a technology whether it's a philosophy whether it's their geopolitics i wish india had a similar thing like china like usa does where they would translate all the mandarin uh, into english so that a lot of indians can be reading it right now uh, what we what the average indian thinker knows about china is very superficial what they translated into english some speech or what the americans have said about china india gets to know but india's own surveillance and understanding of china is very limited because of language and because we've never really pursued that so i would say that uh, uh, the pursuit of knowledge through reading uh, not only the technology reading and the philosophy reading uh, or those are very important also the geopolitics the pragmatic reading of competitors doing what i call purva paksha which means a uh, study of the opponent uh, purva paksha means like in uh, competitive research in marketing that's a purva paksha you you study your competitors in marketing you study them in military you study them in politics all that is purva paksha it it's a very good system in our tradition we forgot we forgot so when the when the muslim invaders came we were not studying them to figure out who are these why are they come what is their strengths how many more will come what is the money they have what is their funding level what do they want i mean we had no theory about them we just allowed them to come next time we would just react it was like when they come we will fight but in the meantime let's not get into bad news let's think positive let's think positive that they won't come back let's think positive that bhagwan is enlighten them and they will not invade us again if they invade us then we'll worry about it that's not good enough you got to anticipate and our tradition has been like that the purva paksha is a part of our tradition that allows you to anticipate that allows you to learn from other people and improve improve your own capability using the best uh, examples from other people so i would encourage purva paksha so one is meditation the other is a lot of studying and research including the purva paksha study of other people and then i think the young people to be futuristic should be courageous to do thought experiments to do courage uh, take risks stick your neck out and say okay here is a proposal and let people argue if they don't like it you don't have to get personal you don't have to ab- abuse somebody because he came up with a proposal that was wrong i are bhaiya you have to be able to make mistakes that's the only way you learn 
if you do not tolerate risk, uh, risks and uh, making mistakes, and the, uh, the, the, uh, it is a calamity uh, uh, that somebody made a mistake and then you have to punish him and go after him and abuse him. If you have a, a culture like that, which is what we currently have, then people will be very safe. Everybody will be a follower. You better get a job with somebody else and then he'll tell you what to do because you, you're too afraid. Uh, that is wrong. So our, our culture, uh, if you look at our history, uh, it is a courageous people sticking their neck out, arguing, full of that. So we have to create uh, in our youth a meditative person, well-read person, uh, people who have got debating skills, which is part of Purva Paksha capability to be able to debate opponents in an articulate way, in a very civil and courteous way. And, and these people have to be extremely strong in taking on challenges. And if the data tells you that something is not right, go, uh, accept it and you have to do something about it. And not not uh, uh, hiding in this feel good comfort zone that I don't want to get into something which is not feel good. A lot of people tell me, sir, up bolne, thiki bolne, hai, but aapne mera feel good kharab kar diya. You know, <laughs> so as if my job is to feel, give him an addictive dose to make him feel good. One of the reasons China is so powerful is because they've raised two generations of youth who were told you're not going to feel good. You may feel shitty because of where, what, where we are, but you got to work hard. You got to work your ass off for the country and you are not here. We're not here to make you feel good. So when you go to China and I've been there many, many times, uh, when you go to China and you talk to people, they're tough. Emotionally, they're tough. They're able to handle uh, adversity because they've had so much adversity and they have not been asked to hide it in, in some Bollywood or some uh, you know, fantasy and all that. Uh, they, they are very realistic in facing adversity. Chinese are rugged, emotionally rugged, tough. That's a great asset when you're yeah. fighting long term. Yeah. You, can make I, your, you can make your people go through a years of suffering. India, you can't do that. Plus, it's a democracy. The, you lose elections if you do that. If you tell people that, look, we are going to go through a period of tightening our belt uh, in terms of how much we go, do for fun, shun, and all that, in order we can channel this so that by 2030 we can be great. Uh, if you do that to people, you lose elections. You have to tell them, Kare Bhaiya, you just vote for me. I'll solve all your problem right away, this, that. So that is, uh, so that one thing, one should also ask, is democracy safe for India? I mean, emotionally, that's what I want as a free thinker. Obviously, I want. But as a pragmatic guy, can we afford the luxury of so much freedom? Or do we want to say that, okay, for 10 years, let there be a government, no elections, no none of this nonsense. Let it just run and build a nation. I mean, all these great nations were built like that. They had, uh, you know, look at Singapore, look at, uh, you know, Taiwan, look at China, look at, you know, Japan. They had a long history, stable, long term, not having to fight for its own survival. That kind of uh, governance, which is given like 10 years, uh, and, and, you know, and, and assume they're all honest people. They're not going to take you for a ride. I think India needs to compromise on its democracy on a temporary basis, not become a dictator, but just extend the tenure of people who've been elected. Maybe say, maybe coordinate all the uh, central and state elections and by uh, in one election day per five years, something like that. And mm -hmm. no no confidence motion, moving this that tabasha drama, all that nonsense. Just you elect it, fine. Unless you committed a crime and you can be impeached, unless that happens. Five years, the guy is in place and he'll do his job. If you have five-year term, maybe 10-year term for certain things, I think it's much better. India should consider that. Uh, Rajiv, sir, there's so many more questions, but I know that you're in the middle of a certain kind of process that you're going through uh, with respect to what you told us at the beginning of the show where you had a certain procedure with your back. And uh, you know what? I'm going to leave all these questions probably for the next time, sir. I just, I feel like I've not even unearthed maybe one or 2% of everything that you have to share with us. Uh, and I guess this was much more a learning session for me for the ideas I want to put into the content I'm creating going forward. So let's just call it a day on this particular episode and I'll allow the audience to kind of send in even more questions the next time you're coming in on the show and we'll have a continuation of our Twitterverse round then. Even the Hindi episode, which will be around all your Vedic learnings, all your learnings about Indian culture. Uh, that's going to be something exciting. 
but as for this episode sir i hope you enjoyed it and i hope it added some value to your life no no i am i am very happy firstly you are a good interviewer you are a smart guy you got your heart in the right place you are a thinker uh, uh, and you you understand your audience and how to bring all these ideas out i am very happy uh, i would love to do many of these uh, in the next few days we can schedule one every day or two we can keep doing this uh, and i want to thank the audience their questions were very important to the point not frivolous questions uh, not cheap shots but serious questions which is what i would like and yeah. i want you to continue raising these kind of questions because you know we should raise the bar and have thoughtful discussion we should encourage more and more of our young people to be very thoughtful and uh, not only in english but also hindi and you know with different languages yeah. i would love to be uh, part of your show on an ongoing basis uh, and i want to thank you for that no. so namaste to all of you until we meet again yes thank you again sir i'm hoping to have you again maybe for some thematic episodes the next time so thank you for joining us on the ranveer show thank you so much so that was a episode with rajiv malhotra occasionally on this podcast i end up creating an episode with someone where i know that there's at least 10 more episodes in that person and this was one of those episodes this was my first interaction with him he's a legend in the world of indian twitter he has got an infinite amount of knowledge that he's accumulated over the years and i promise you that rajiv malhotra is going to be back on the ranveer show i'd also like to know which other guests in this geopolitics domain you guys would like to see on the ranveer show and with that once again remember trs is a spotify exclusive now every episode's available on spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world If you like this episode make sure you hit that thumbs up button make sure you tell us on our social media handles and make sure you share this episode with your friends namaste see you next time